This is Brian Schwartz from the University of California, San Francisco. Uh, this first section is going to be a discussion of Neisseria species and a focus on microbiology and some pathogenesis. The learning objectives for this session are to know the key ways to identify Neisseria species in the clinical microbiology laboratory, describe the key virulence factors of pathogenic Neisseria species, and understand some of the key immune responses to Neisseria infection. So let's start off talking a little bit about Neisseria species in general. They are gram-negative diplococci, and you can see this image here. They are very small kidney bean-shaped um, organisms. They are gram-negative, they stain red, and you can see them adjacent to neutrophils and see how much smaller they are. They're very unique in terms of their morphology and can usually be relatively easily identified. Most Neisseria species are in fact non-pathogenic, and I think as we learn more and more about bacteria, we realize that more, most bacteria are non-pathogenic. But there are two bad apples. They are Neisseria meningitidis and Neisseria gonorrhea. These are probably bacteria that you've heard about even prior uh, to your medical training. So let's talk a little bit about these and contrast and compare. Neisseria meningitidis, it enters through the respiratory tract, so it can actually be transmitted through droplets from person to person. Then it goes into the bloodstream, and we'll talk a little bit about some of the properties that allow it to invade. And then it has a neurotropism, meaning that it does have a predilection to enter the cerebral spinal fluid, and in some patients they will develop meningitis. Um, and then the other syndrome that we discuss about, and you saw it in the introductory video, is something called meningococcemia, which um, you'll hear more about, but essentially is a disseminated severe infection. This is to contrast to Neisseria gonorrhea infection. Neisseria gonorrhea infection, for the most part, enters through the uh, general urinary tract because it is predominantly a sexually transmitted disease. And in some cases, it'll go into the blood and you can have disseminated infection, although this is less common. The types of disease we see that were cervicitis and urethritis, sometimes pelvic inflammatory disease. In neonates, you can see neonatal conjunctivitis when a neonate will actually acquire um, gonorrhea from the mother following vaginal delivery. And in disseminated infection, occasionally you can see things like tenosynovitis uh, and rash. The reason that I have an overlap in, in these terms of these two um, circles are there are some rare instances where the clinical syndromes can be mistaken for each other. And this is usually in cases of, of arthritis, uh, chronic arthritis. That's not common and not what I would focus on learning about these pathogens, but there are occasional situations where um, the that you may be mistaken about the clinical identity. So let's talk a little bit about the identification of Neisseria species. First, I like to think about them in general as high maintenance bugs. So they need special medium, which we term as one of them to grow as chocolate auger. And chocolate auger is like routine blood auger, but this blood auger is heated. And so some of the um, nutrients inside it are, are broken down and they leak out. And so what the uh, organisms are able to do is utilize those because they don't have the enzymes to get them themselves. The second is they need special conditions. They grow in what's termed as a microaerophilic environment or a low oxygen environment. Um, and here I have a picture of a candle uh, because they grow are grown often in candle jars and that's how we are able to get this microaerophilic environment. So you can think of them as um, Neisseria species, these high, high maintenance bugs that like to go for a special night out and like to get chocolate and um, like to have candlelit dinners. So if those are some ways to maybe help you remember some of these special medium. How do you differentiate the two? Well, when you have Neisseria species and you're trying to differentiate Neisseria meningitidis from Neisseria gonorrhea, um, we tend to use different sugars and look at their fermentation patterns. So let's start by looking at Neisseria gonorrhea. And you can see I underlined the G in gonorrhea in this case because it... Um, ferments glucose but not maltose or sucrose. You can see the glucose here is a uh, tube is yellow, uh, means that there's fermentation, there's a change in pH, although that you do not see that with maltose and sucrose. This is to be differentiated with Neisseria meningitidis. This word has both an M and a G in it. So to help you remember, it ferments both glucose and maltose. Um, and that's one way, to, a kind of easy way to help you remember the differentiation and fermentation patterns. 
How about the pathogenesis? So what are some of the key virulence factors of Neisseria meningitis? First, it does a great job of evading the immune system. Um, I'm a Harry Potter fan, so uh, you can see Harry Potter with his invisibility cloak on. Um, it protects itself by secreting IgA proteases, uh, so the IgA is eliminated and it isn't seen, and then it encloaks itself in a polysaccharide capsule, which in, uh, prevents it from getting um, uh, ingested by neutrophils. The other important virulence factor that explains a lot of its clinical disease is um, this overstimulation of the immune system because it has lipooligosaccharide, L, um, which is identical, nearly identical to lipopolysaccharide or LPS, uh, which pan stimulates the immune system. When the macrophage see it, it stimulates toll like receptors, which causes release of IL 1, uh, TNF, nitric oxide, um, activates complement system, and then actually activates tissue factor. So, really extensive activation of all parts of the um, innate immune system. And you can see um, this is where it goes crazy. I'm going to elaborate on the Harry Potter analogy. And you can see Voldemort uh, causing all sorts of destruction um, when, uh, L when it's um, in the presence of lipooligosaccharide. So clinically, what happens, this is, to me, thinking about the clinical picture of meningococcemia, fever, septic shock, disseminated intravascular co coagulation, fever, you get from IL-1 release, septic shock, you get uh, activation of tissue factor, or excuse me, activation of NO, uh, nitric oxide, which causes vasodilation, disseminated intravascular co coagulation with activations of complement and tissue factor, etc. How about Neisseria gonorrhea pathogenesis? Their key uh, virulence factors. This one is different, so it's really effective at attaching to the uh, genital urinary mucosa. And um, I think of their primary uh, virulence factor are these pili, and you can kind of see it analogous to the ice climber using those picks to really stick onto the the face of the ice wall and not not letting go. It also has the ability to evade the immune system through IgA proteases, which are present in the mucosal surfaces of the GU tract, just like they were the respiratory tract. Neisseria gonorrhea, however, does not have a polysaccharide capsule in contrast to Neisseria meningitidis. So how about the immune response to Neisseria? So specific antibodies, um, when they are produced, are effective. Um, but ideally, you would, particularly with Neisseria meningitis, you would want something that act, that's active against that polysaccharide capsule. And there's actually a vaccine that's directed to do just that. The polymorphonuclear leukocytes, um, when they can get it, are effect, can, can avoid the other virulence factors produced by these uh, organisms, able to get their um, selves around these organisms, can ingest them. And then complement is also an important factor. And, and maybe you've learned this before, but particularly uh, people who have deficiency in the membrane attack complements, uh, components of the complement, C6 through C9, um, have deficiencies and their ability to stop Neisseria infection. And if you had a patient with recurrent Neisseria meningitidis type infection, you'd be worried particularly about um, the uh, terminal complement pathway deficiencies. The way that I think about deficiencies in the terminal complement pathway is the terminal complement pathway uh, in thinking about like a pin that you're going to use to pop a balloon, the, terminant, the terminal component, particularly like C9, is kind of the sharp end of that pin. And you could be really pressing, and, and the balloon is, 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 like, is like you're pressing into it, trying to poke a hole into that bacteria or balloon. But if you don't have that sharp end to it, it's really not going to work. And that's what that uh, terminal portion of the complement uh, pathway allows you to do, is to have that sharp end um, to push through the bacteria and kill it. So in summary, Neisseria species are gram-negative diplococci, kidney bean-shaped. Neisseria meningitidis invades through the re respiratory epithelium and has um, a predilection to go to the cerebral spinal fluid and cause meningitis. It can also cause disseminated infection, meningococcemia, and the lipooligosaccharide causes pain stimulation of the immune system and really disseminated disease. Um, Neisseria gonorrhea predominantly invades the GU tract and uses its pili to attach on, um, causes localized disease, but occasionally to, can disseminate.